Hi everyone, turn in your Bibles today to Psalm 8, and uh, we're on this Messianic Psalm, Psalm 8, Psalm of the Son of Man. Psalm 8, I won't read all the verses, but uh, we'll pick it up in verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants or sucklings you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. And then we'll drop down uh, to verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have covered, crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Now, Psalm 8 is a messianic psalm. Uh, we saw earlier in our series, Psalm 2, also a messianic psalm. And we get a striking counterpoint between the two psalms in that in Psalm 2, we see Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Son of God. But in this psalm, Psalm 8, we see him <clears throat> as the Son of Man. Uh, the psalm opens with, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. That sets the tone for the psalm. Uh, it's the excellent glory of the Lord above all things. And ultimately, Messiah will be over all things, ruling and reigning. This is the, the, the sense of the psalm, the gist of the psalm. Verse 2, uh, we have um, uh, also quoted in the New Testament, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, you have ordained strength, or in the New Testament, you have ordained praise, actually, because it's quoted from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. And uh, this was quoted by the Lord Jesus when he was on the temp in the Temple Mount a few days before... <clears throat> or uh, shortly at least, before he was uh, crucified. And, you know, the children were running about in the temple precincts, and they were saying, uh, Hosanna, uh, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, and calling him the son of David, and so on. And the Pharisees uh, tried to stifle them and shut them up. And the Lord Jesus uh, quoted this uh, verse from the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 8, of the mouth of babes and sucklings, or nursing infants, you have ordained praise. But then we get into the, the, the core of, of the psalm uh, about the Son of Man. And, you know, uh, this was probably written by David, you know, when he was a young man, a shepherd up in the fields, and he's looking at the stars of the heavens and so on, and he began to consider his his smallness. And, and he, so he writes, what is man that you were mindful of him, and the Son of Man that you visit him? And probably when David was penning this, he was thinking of actually the first creation and, and the first Adam, how Adam was created and made a little low, lower than the angels positionally, but set over all the works of, of creation. And um, But, you know, the Holy Spirit, even when uh, speaking of David or speaking of Adam or any of these Old Testament uh, figures, often they are but types of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in this case, Adam is a type of the Lord Jesus. He was set over the works of creation. But the Holy Spirit is looking down the, <clears throat> the annals of time and looking towards uh, the last Adam, the second man out of heaven, and the one who calls himself uh, the Son of Man. You know, the Lord Jesus, this is, was one of his favorite titles. He would, he would quote this again and again in reference to himself, the Son of Man. Now, the, with the Son of Man, uh, the thought basically is twofold. There's two features connected with the Son of Man. Uh, one feature is his sufferings, his lowliness, his humbleness. And the other feature is his glory, his power, his second coming, his kingdom. For example, uh, the Lord Jesus could say uh, that um, he, was, he would be rejected. The Son of Man would be rejected uh, uh, by uh, the, you know, the leaders of the people of Israel and, and into the hands of sinners and be crucified. Uh, and so on. And then he would have other times he would speak of the Son of Man as uh, the Son of Man coming in, <clears throat> in the power and the glory of the Father and all the holy angels with him. You'll see the Son of Man revealed on the clouds. And so those two features, it'll be either one or the other when you read about the Son of Man, either his lowliness, his pathway here on earth and his work down here as a suffering uh, Savior, or his power, his coming, his glory, and his kingdom. Now, with the Son of Man, it's interesting. First of all, this psalm, Psalm 8, is the first mention of the Son of Man that we get in the Bible. And 
I always say this to the young uh, Bible students, that first mentions in the scripture are important. This is the first mention of the Son of Man. The last mention of the Son of Man, you might want to check it out later, is in Revelation chapter 14, I believe it's verse 14, where we see the Son of Man seated on the clouds of heaven uh, with a scythe or a sickle in his hand, ready to reap the harvest of the earth. And there it's the day of the Lord, and the Lord is going to reap the harvest of the earth in judgment at his second coming. But I want to, you to note these two references, the, 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 the first mention and the last mention, both refer to the head of the Lord Jesus. Here in Psalm 8, we see him, uh, it says in verse 5, crowned with glory and honor. That's a crown of glory and honor upon his head. Then in Revelation uh, chapter 14, verse 14, we see the Son of Man with a crown of gold upon his head. So it, the first psalm, the first mention of the Son of Man, I should say, uh, mentions his head, and the last uh, mention of the Son of Man brings his head before us. But there's something else as well. Uh, the first mention of the Son of Man in the New Testament is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 20, uh, where the Lord Jesus said to a, a would-be disciple, uh, The foxes have holes, uh, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. <clears throat> his head is mentioned there again, but there the idea is not being crowned with glory and honor or the, the, the crown of gold upon his head, the glory and the coming uh, of his kingdom, but rather his humility, his lowliness, no place on this earth to lay his head. And then we get another expression in that section between verse uh, 4 and 6. At the very end of verse 6, it says of the Son of Man, Thou hast put all things under his feet. Now, this verse is quoted uh, three times in the New Testament. Uh, first, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, in connection with the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus to the right hand of the Father. And there we see the Son of Man uh, raised up uh, and seated at the right hand of God. And it says, He's head, He will be head over all things along with the church, or to the church, which is his body, his assembly. And what Paul is bringing out to us there is that is the Son of Man will reign over all things uh, in, in heaven and earth, principalities and powers and so on. Every name that is named, we get that in Philippians 2. Uh, but to the, to the church, which is his body. In other words, the church there, uh, the assembly of God, uh, all true believers, is seen as the complement of Christ that she will reign with him, that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. He is the head and we are the body. We will be over all things with him and his millennial rule. Uh, the second mention is in 1 uh, Corinthians 15, verse 25, and there the subject is resurrection also, but not ascension, but resurrection. And there we see the Apostle Paul quoting this, and he says that uh, all enemies will be put under his feet, but the last enemy that will be put under his feet is death. And we know more uh, from the book of Revelation, uh, where at the end of the millennium, that even death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire. There will be no death in the new heaven and the new earth. It will be in an et eternal, glorified, fixed state. That's why sin will never enter. You can never, you never have to worry about falling into sin. You never will never have to worry about sin or death ever entering in or marring that scene in the new heaven and new earth. Death will be put away, be put under his feet, the last enemy. And then in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, we get uh, this uh, verse 6, the end of verse 6, Thou hast put all things under his feet, mentioned also, quoted also. And there he quotes the, the previous verse, verse 5, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and has crowned him with glory and honor. And the writer of the Hebrews adds something to this. You have made him a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That's why he was became lower than the angels. Although personally, he, of course, Messiah was always greater than the angels. Hebrews 1 brings that out. But in becoming a man, he takes that place in humility for the suffering of death, that he would die for sinners to associate ourselves with him. Uh, but it says uh, in Hebrews, yet we do not see all things yet put under his feet. That's yet future. But by faith, we see him crowned with glory and honor. We see him now crowned with glory and honor, although the world does not yet see him so. Well, may uh, you dig into the psalm a little more and be encouraged by it. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's the Son of Man. And dear friend, he's coming very soon.